Welcome everybody. This is the latest Alliance Forum of 2021. My name is Andrew Turner and I'm a member of the UK BIM Communities Leadership Team, which is part of the engagement stream. Thank you for joining us virtually, as with the current climate, we decided to continue with the forum, but virtually, and I'm hoping you're all doing well. <clears throat> so before we start the presentations, let me just tell you a little bit about GoToWebinar. You are all in listen-only mode. If you do have a question, please ask this through the questions tab, as you can see here. We will have the Q&A session after everyone has presented. Please do avoid using the raised hand option for questions. You should also note we are recording this session and we will make it available to view to all UK BIM Alliance YouTube account holders as soon as we can. We just move on to the agenda, thank you. So we have an interesting agenda for you today. We hope you'll enjoy it. It should keep you focused and take your mind off all matters that may be happening this evening. Uh, we're going to start with Anne, who's going to have a sort of 10 year on from the government construction strategy. From there, Pam will then give us updates in regards to all things UK BIM Alliance. Then we've got an exciting group of panelists looking at people, process and technology in regard to the strategy. That's Alison Watson, Paul Shilcock, David Church, Sarah Davidson and Paul Wilkinson. Uh, we may or may not have a view from the chair, but we will finish with questions and answers. So as I said before, please do post those questions. We will field what we can as we go and we'll open up the forum at the end, of, at the end as well. So I'm now going to pass you over to Anne, who's going to give you uh, a review of the government construction strategy 10 years on. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone, and it's lovely to see you today. I'll just turn myself off. There we go. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to give you a quick canter through of the last 10 years and where we are right now. So I, actually, it was only at lunchtime I was thinking, well, personally, where was I? And maybe just reflect yourselves. And I then had an eight year old, a 12 year old and 15 year old, all girls all starting to enter into interesting times with teenage years. So it kind of put me into the, well, let's set this as a bit of a journey in a similar way. Uh, so um, actually a year on, uh, and now of course my screen is frozen for some reason. Okay, Pam, you may need to unshare me for a moment. My screen is frozen. Uh, okay, bear with me. See how you get on, Anne, if you can reshare. If not, I will try and find your slides. And yeah, okay. Do that. If you just bear with me, I'm just going to reboot the. Of course, it's sod law, isn't it? Because we did test this just before we started and it all was working fine. OK, if you um, want to um, share screen again for me, please, Pam. Yep. OK, so let's have another go. So a counter through the last 10 years. I think what we want to do, first of all, is just to reflect on what uh, BIM is. So I think all of you know now, you're well aware, we're not talking of anything other than better information management. It being a process of defining, creating and delivering structure data and documents, but the purpose of it is to make sure that the right information is available to the right person at the right time to enable better decision making. And this is for the whole life cycle of built environment assets. This is a really daunting timeline. I should think a lot of you have seen this before. We will be sharing the slides, so I'm not proposing to go through this in any detail yet. But I suppose just to highlight to you, I'm not going to dwell so much on the development of the 1192 series. I think that we can take that as read. I'll be talking more about what the industry responses have been and the changes that have um, occurred since the 1192 series. 
Um, so a little bit lighthearted, thinking about the birth and the early years of BIM. In those days, I was heading up geospatial at Atkins. Um, I was feeling that really there were all these different technologies. Actually, we were talking about information. Why could we not actually bring these silos of technologies together, whether they could come from CAD or G GIS or what we were referring to as BIM or 3D modeling at the time and be able to realize um, a virtual essentially what we would now be calling heaven help us a global digital twin and this would be really facilitating for us to all be working virtually across the whole of the globe so atkins as with other uh, consultancies work globally but now goodness how pertinent that is uh, with the covid experience that we've had over the last 18 years i hope you can hear me i've just got a helicopter flying overhead at the moment And yet, in the background, we'd already got the BS 1192-2007 being developed, um, uh, with key author being uh, Mervyn Richards. And coming out of that, a lot of conversations about what's going on with the government, uh, with the construction industry and the built environment, and how we really needed to improve on this. So, a government construction strategy came out in May 2011. Uh, looking at, for instance, 15, 20% cost and carbon reduction for all centrally procured government construction projects, but also talking about this fully collaborative 3D BIM. That was actually being really pushed by Francis Maud, so we'd really got the attention of Cabinet Office, and then that being driven forward with the setup of the UK BIM Task Group. There was even at this time a push that actually what we wanted was business outcomes. That was the big win. It wasn't around the design, construct, test and commission, but certainly about the operate and maintain. But, but unfortunately, we had this real focus at the start of design and construct. And we kind of lost a sense of what we were doing this, what was the end result? What was the end purpose that we were really after? Construction 2025 came out in July 2013, still pushing that we'd got problems in the built environment sector, saying, right, we need to be really ambitious about what we want to accomplish. So by 2020, really looking at lower costs, faster delivery of 50%, 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, 50% reduction in the trade gap. Do all of these sound quite familiar to you still? And then, of course, we had the iconic wedge diagram that we were all so earnest about in those times. So it's landed. We've got through that birth and early years. Now we're coming into some troubled waters, the teenage years. And uh, I was talking to somebody earlier today who was saying that they could compare sometimes the behaviours that they saw in the industry with their three-year-old. And I guess I was in that situation at this time, looking at my teenagers as well. So we were being bombarded from all sides. There were many, many flavours of what this BIM level two should be. But ultimately, we were still really pushing that we are talking about whole life cycle information management. We need to start with the end in mind, and it is for anything which is built. We then had some iconic characters coming forward, the Paul Morels, Dave Phil, Mark Bew, many, many uh, presentations coming forward to try to inspire people and to engage people. So the BIM beast, so this BIM iceberg, I wonder whether how many of you can remember that, really pushing that there's an awful lot that's hidden that people don't understand or talk about. And then, of course, we had the suite of uh, the BIM level two documents. It's always amused me that derivation was actually spelt wrong, but never mind. But you could see that there was a lot going on, whether it be through uh, the HM government construction strategy, BIS, BIM task group, CIC, BSI. And then we did have, at that time, we had started the BIM four groups. There were the BIM regions all triggered from the UK BIM task group. There was the department mental summary roadmap which was being presented year on year to demonstrate that the 
government departments were working together trying to really push for a procurement in a consistent manner and they were really moving to that 2016 deadline. On an industry side, of course, our experience was, was different, was it was really feeling, well, this is very much a government initiative, what about it for us? So whether it be Atkins, uh, consultancies, con, uh, contractors, I think we were all trying to struggle to really define, well, what is this BIM level to? And what is being asked of us? And one of the things that we were really going for is, look, you know, we've got to get the standards in place. We really need some kind of a digital plan of work. Well, yes, okay, we can be transferring to 3D, but the standards are really key to this. But actually, we can only be level two ready. We cannot be boasting that we're level two if the clients haven't actually been asking for it and if there's a good match between what they're asking for and what we're delivering. So I remember this coming up. I, forgive me, I can't remember who, who came up with this, but information management, the need, and the responsibility just passing around so it actually didn't land with anybody. And I think you know, very much those teenage years, we were still in that phase. We were still looking at, well, if there isn't any information management, we're still in that CAD mode. We've separated that technical um, side of, of, uh, of drawing up what is intended with the engineers and so forth. So somehow the conversations, the dialogue have broken up. What we want is to actually get a collaborative BIM team. And I'm sure that we're going to hear a little bit later more about what that collaboration really means. But to how many of us actually saw that there was still that lonely limp BIM who refused absolutely to be following any standards or common approach? How many of you remember the Institution of Civil Engineers BIM heat map that launched in 2013 and we started tracking it so up to, to 2016, but I haven't actually decided, I decided I wouldn't actually show you all of them. Uh, but it was showing that there was a general trend, but I think it'll be useful for us to actually compare with the most recent UK BIM Alliance survey, just what progress genuinely has been made rather the, than the, the, the BIM speak that has been going on. Because I don't know about you, but at this time I was really thinking, why are we struggling so much? You know, we're, there's an awful lot of boasting going on, but what is really genuinely happening here? Are we going to be able to achieve uh, you know, passing across the finish line in 2016? At a similar time, February 2015, Digital Built Britain was published Level 3, Building Information Modelling, Strategic Plan. Huge excitement around this, um, and I think it was already existing. But do you remember the race there was? Oh, we're already doing BIM th a Level 3. Um, I certainly heard, I know that others have said that they were hearing about BIM Level 10. Really not a very helpful way of approaching this. And then 2016 arrives, level two BIM is here. So, you know, CAD is passed on, we're into a full 3D modeling world, or are we? And is that really what it's about? Pharma review comes out October 2016, still really damning. You know, we've got to modernize or we'll die. What are we going to do about it? And at that time, because the UK BIM task group was essentially moving on to whatever BIM level three would be with digital built Britain, we were then asked as the BIM regions and BIM fours, whether we could take on responsibility for taking on the BIM implementation journey. So some of you may recall that we came together and we decided what we would do is to set up the UK BIM Alliance. And one of the things we recognized was that actually, you know, we had a massive job to do to actually engage the private sector, you know, looking at maybe 75% actually of all new work coming through the private sector. So some of you may remember this, our mission was to facilitate and ensure adoption and implementation of BIM Level 2 as business as usual by 2020, and a goal of 75% for the supply and demand chain. Oh dear. Um, I think we realized in the end that that was so hugely ambitious and very, very difficult to demonstrate as well. But our values haven't changed. We still want to be innovative, inclusive, collaborative, supportive, transparent, but also forward thinking as well. 
And I think that's an important thing for us to remember is where, where we really did start from. And we did get a lot of good signatories coming through. Um, as I say, I'll share the slides so you'll be able to review this. And there's still a lot of uh, familiar faces uh, present now. We were really keen to establish from the BIM force in the regions what their key challenges were. And a lot of it, and still is, around resource, staffing, time, funding, sponsorship, client buy-in, supply chain buy-in. And although we'd set ourselves that challenge, we very quickly, as I say, realised, oh my goodness, this is massive. How on earth do we achieve 2.5 million by 2020, when probably if we're more realistic, we've only got to 50, 100k so far. So we really needed to grow beyond our current boundaries and make sure that we weren't just talking to ourselves. Some of you also will remember this evolving landscape. This was actually something I believe it was Neil Thompson who developed this. And actually, it's quite interesting to see that we'd got Brexit mapped, we'd got political uncertainty there around the 2020, and quite anticipated COVID hitting and making such a difference. But what we were really trying to push at the time is that the, the, the UK BIM was actually the here and now helping us to realise digital transformation. That's absolutely what the movement was set up for, was to allow us to understand and control the shift from analogue to digital, moving from you know, the challenge of people saying, well, what's wrong, we just use the post, to moving to more of a direct database to database communication. So, you know, and we're still talking about uh, interoperability, which I'll touch on a little bit later. But this for me was where we kept on hitting problems is that although people were saying, oh yeah, yeah, we want to collaborate, we want to cooperate, were they actually listening? Were we listening? Was I listening? Or was I really determined that my opinion was the right one and I'll do it my own way? Thank you very much. What I coined as the bin bear bust. We have learned a lot and I think, you know, again, I'm sure that some of the speakers will talk about this later, but um, I think being able to open, be open and listen to others and their opinions and where they're coming from, I think is really important. So this, the BS 1192 part one, and goodness knows how many versions of this you'll all have seen, but you know, the principles are still there in today. And some of you may remember that we set up actual um, uh, uh, analog, if you like, exercises of getting people into a room and acting a role. So they might act as the client or as the coordinators or as the architects. And then just explore with them what in what dialogue do they actually need and what is the data that they needed. So for instance, I had here set up at key stages, key decision points, Mars bars, and actually you can't see it, but there's a bottle of champagne. Um, and actually they got stuck in the first hurdle was that uh, they realized that actually this was as much about people and dialogue as it was about process. And it certainly wasn't about the technology, not within this context. This, of course, has been a diagram which has come, become more and more familiar to us, um, but really trying to emphasize again that it's whole life that we're talking about. If you don't do your homework, if you don't actually determine what your information requirements are, you might as well go to jail as of the Monopoly game. And this was happening not only within the supply chain, but certainly within the, the, the government departments and within other clients as well, is to really start to understand what your key decision points are and what's the data that's needed to actually inform those. But gosh, you know, how many uh, uh, blockers did we actually have in front of us? We needed to bring buildings and infrastructure together. And we certainly had a good try at it, haven't we? Um, I wonder whether we've actually completed that job or not. And then we've got the different types of people. Now, forgive me that this is a little bit of a cartoon, but you know, actually, to, to some extent, we have still got the digital natives who are wondering what on earth we're making such an issue of. We've got the digital transients who actually, if we can convince them that this is the way to go, can be our best proponents. 
But we also have to recognize, and I'm afraid I did use to use my husband as an example, the digital alien who really doesn't have a clue and really doesn't want to know either. I have to add that Martin has completely transformed since that time. But I wonder how many of you have heard oh, the BIM virtual coordination, yeah, go away. It's just too hard. We'd ha rather have more fun working it out on the full size mock-up, i.e. in the real world. And then we have this influence versus the cost curve is, you know, the typical en value engineering. Is that still built within in, inherent within our procurement? Um, is it still that we can do that value engineering right at the last moment at the end of construction? Um, or do we actually want to bring it into the virtual building design? That being the proposed entry, being a much cheaper way to explore changes before we go into the real world. But I think, again, the challenge needs to be but what is the purpose? What are we driving for? Have we really got the right questions in front of us? Are we thinking about whole life? And then one of the other things is to just remember that, you know, bad data spreads just like a virus, but then so does bad behavior. If you can't get trust actually moving through the system and supporting good, strong, robust relationships, then we really are onto a hiding for nothing. But moving to a coming of age, where are we? In the background, we've got 8536 developing, which is you know, the government's soft landings, but really looking at that whole life approach. We had in the background, actually, the international BIM standardization starting. Not that many people were aware of that. But even in that early time of November 2016, we'd already got a draft uh, uh, standard in place. And it was looking at, and this is very much looking at the, the digital built Britain perspectives. We weren't just looking at it from an asset owner perspective. We were looking at it from a societal perspective too. And that is inbuilt into the, the ISOs. And what was visionary was the um, project such as High Speed 2, which still is driving forward, which had this great uh, image, which I think is just as valid today as it was when it was first uh, uh, developed. And supporting really where we were coming from with the principles of uh, ISO 19650 is that it needs to be within the context of asset and organizational management. And I'm delighted that we've got our two star authors, Paul Shilcock and David uh, uh, Churcher, uh, are going to be speaking a little bit later today. And do you remember Crossrail and Malcolm Taylor? So really presenting that they needed to be thinking about service, so predictable 24 seven, et cetera, et cetera. So what did they need to actually inbuild into the system and into the information to be able to accomplish that? Who were the people? Who were the functions who would need that data? What were the assets? And then to consider how do we deliver that through a central data hub? And then the tensions between different worlds, building smart, um, and we've got KC Rutland um, here as a chair of uh, the Building Smart, as well as vi vice chair of uh, the UK BIM Alliance, talking to the Open Geospatial Consortium. Those conversations still carrying on. But I think one of the important things, and one that I'd still be keen for us to do is to dare to, to, to push the boundaries a bit and dare to be controversial. Your collaboration is about having tough conversations, but being very respectful and being able to buy into consensus at the end of it. And I'd love us to be doing even more of that. We had some really great conversations, for instance, talking about an integrated digital built environment and just how we could actually get building information modeling working with geospatial modeling. The whole principle being we are talking just about data and information and it needs to work together. British Standards Institution was working really hard to keep supporting the BIM level two as the UK BIM task group had moved on. And they developed this graphic to try to explain that actually we were working with the foundations of digital transformation. Even so, at that time, it was very clear that the interest of, uh, of industry was elsewhere, yet whether they be writing, or whether they'd be reading about it, it really wasn't happening and connecting with BIM and information management, which at the end of the day, we wanted to be underpinning 
so much. The UK BIM Alliance was going from strength to strength, so we had a bigger and bigger team, but not compared to where we've got to now. But it's fantastic to be able to re re reflect on all of the people that we had, even at this stage, who were willing to put in so much time pro bono to help move us forward. And at that time, we then had uh, Building Smart UK and Ireland come within the UK BIM Alliance uh, umbrella. As I say, um, I stepped aside to allow Casey Rutland to become the chair of Building Smart UK and Ireland uh, with a number now of vice chairs and supports in there with Nick Nisbet still very much active within that too. Really important though that we're you know, relevant today, but relevant for the future as well. And this is where I think we hit a little bit of a midlife crisis, although I think it was so essential because suddenly we had the ISOs landing in November 2018. And how do we present that to industry now, to, to those who had already invested in the 1192 suite and BIM level two, and now saying, well, actually you've got to turn to ISO. Initially, we were talking about a BIM level two wrapper, a UK BIM, based upon using ISO standards. The good thing already was that we then had the three organisations of British Standards Institution, Centre of Digital Built Britain and the UK BIM Alliance collaborating to ensure that actually we really do make sure that there's a common voice here. And you know, it really is some of it going back to the basics of state what you want, plan how and when to deliver it, deliver it, approve it, make sure there's a feedback loop so that we can learn. And uh, uh, this is an opera room. So Paul, you'll recognize these, uh, these uh, uh, slides. So what if I'm already using the 1192 standards? This was a presentation we did at a BSI conference, current 1192 series from January 2019, what would be available, the ISO part one and part two um, with a transition guidance. But of course, from January 2019, what we were envisaging from 2020 was we'd have part three there and we'd have part five. That is indeed what happened. But we also then started to look at ISO 19650 guidance documents. And many of you will recognize just how much effort has gone into that. David Churcher developed this slide, really highlighting what the key uh, highlights of the ISO 9650 series um, were and how that differed from 1192. But I think the important thing, and this still carries on today, is that you know, we do want to be able to communicate a common approach here without gui guiding the whole of industry without confusion. But I think again, there's a little bit of a misunderstanding is that, you know, we were only talking to a very small part of the industry. The vast part of the industry hadn't yet engaged with BIM Level 2 anyway. And then, of course, we had a number of key disruptors. We had the awful Grenville disaster in June 2017. And of course, all the activities that have happened since around the bill on building safety and the Golden Thread initiative. We had the data for the public good report coming out in December 2017, recommending a national digital twin and a digital framework. So how did that fit with the UK BIM framework? But we did launch with BSI and the CDBB uh, in November 2019, the UK BIM framework. And this was a rebrand and really important, I think, is to really uh, draw a line and say, We've got the UK BIM framework. This is where you need to get to. It is the overarching approach to managing information throughout the whole life of assets, making up the built environment, using the ISO 19650 framework within a UK context. You'll notice that there was a convergence with uh, the, the, the vision of the Centre of Digital Built Britain. Uh, with the UK BIM framework and the principles of ISO 19650. So this very much is in the here and now, underpinning any steps that would be needed to go into what is still a relatively undefined future. So the here and now. We've got the 19650 series. You'll see 
that uh, we've got part four and now part six in progress. So part six is, is just starting off um, over this summer now, that's the health and safety. But we've also got established the UK BIM framework, the Alliance supports the website, uh, BSI obviously still working hard on the de development of the standards, uh, the UK BIM Alliance taking a lead on developing the guidance with the protocols and the tools. And clearly what we need to do also is to help people in understanding how to integrate that with the remaining 1192 series. Please do go on to the ukbimframework.org website where you'll see the guidance available. It is structured, we hope, in a clear way, but I'm also pleased to, uh, to say, and I'm sure that Sarah Davidson will talk about this a bit later, is that we are putting this into a digital tool as well, so it'll make it a lot easier to move around. The PDFs will still be available. Another thing which has occurred is BIM interoperability. So the UK BIM Alliance has been working uh, together uh, with uh, CDBB and now CPNI through uh, the, the, the BIM interoperability expert group active last year and now the government and industry interoperability group in 2021. So some primary recommendations and secondary ones which we're looking at, uh, making a recommendation about a refreshing of the mandate, but also looking at classification, IFC and COBE, um, uh, education and skills, information management platform, etc. So a bit of a, a, a rough um, and ready uh, scanter through the timeline. Um, you know, I think you can see we can't sit back on our laurels. We certainly need to be heading for continuous improvement. And we do need to make the UK BIM framework as far as possible business as usual. But my goodness, we've still got a lot of work to do. Yeah, we are about taking that first fundamental step in the journey to digital transformation. We have a great team supporting all of these activities, but we are only here to serve the industry as a whole. We've got some great platinum patrons. We've got some great gold, silver and bronze patrons. We've got some super ambassadors. And we've got an amazing UK BIM Alliance communities, uh, regions and the BIM fours, obviously running their forum as well. But hopefully you can see just the, how much the teams have expanded. This is not just about one or two stars. We've got so many people striving and working so hard to ensure that this all happens. The affiliate program has really taken off this year and can't thank this team um, too much either for the efforts that are uh, that are being put in to bringing the uh, professional institutions and the trade associations together and again that's one initiative also which is getting great recognition and we've got the technology group which is run by Paul Wilkinson again some of our key uh, sponsors um, and patrons come from the technology group but I think finally, as a just to, uh, to, to really confirm where we've got to as a UK BIM Alliance is uh, this uh, quote from Fergus, which I just received this morning, which is to, you know, from, from a, a government perspective as well, there's real acknowledgement that the information management has come along, uh, using BIM has come a long way since that mandate in 2011 which was implemented then in 2016, but we've moved to 19650. But this wouldn't be possible without the enthusiasm and hard work of many individuals across industry, including those who are part of the UK BIM Alliance and who give up their time to support the creation of the UK BIM framework and the guidance it provides. So 10 years on, Fergus is the first to admit that there's more for us to do with the drive towards digital, including continued focus on information management using BIM as set out in the construction playbook. We are still fully committed to continuing to make progress in order to benefit both UK industry and government. And I think that's something which is uh, so important for us to be doing is to be working together. So what is the UK BIM Alliance as a final reminder? It is you. 
Our work is for the industry and by the industry. And what comes next? Well, what a shopping list. I could start with, we have got to increase our reach across the built environment industry. I think we really do have to simplify our message so it lands for a number of different audiences. We need to help more people take that first step and help them not to feel inhibited. We make our guidance more accessible. We need to increase the tools available. What else is there? I'm sure you could contribute to this list. But at the end of the day, let's just make sure we get the basics right for everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sam. <coughs> Fantastic presentation. Yep. Um, uh, and thank you for that. I'm sure there'll be co questions coming in, which we will go through at the end, but thank you. Um, I'm now going to talk you through some of the work of the Alliance um, before handing over to the people you want to hear from, um, Alison, Paul, Paul, Sarah and David, uh, who will be talking about people, process and technology from a construction strategy point of view. So if I just uh, flick through some of the key things that I will cover, the State of the Nation report, some positioning statements, events, quick update from implementation, Building Smart UK, and the technology group as well. So let's start with the survey. So at a Q1 Alliance Forum, Andy Bootle shared some of the initial findings with you via a PowerPoint presentation. We now have the actual report, which is ready to, well, it has been published today, literally, I think five minutes ago on the website, which you, and I will share the link with you in a moment. We've had a number of associations who supported the survey and sending out the survey in questions. And throughout the report, you will see quotes from these organisations that tie in with some of the results as well. Anne herself has provided a forward uh, about the, the survey and the results. And then we get into the main findings. You'll see here two examples. This is the first and this is the second where we have results. And what we've done is we've included observations as part of the findings. These observations include some of the actions that need to take place going forward as well. We did have various people enter comments that on reasons as to why they weren't doing BIM. You can see here, see here I found the old way more productive, BIM is just the latest cliche, there was a number of different ones and we highlighted six and then we provided a clarification around why BIM is still important as part of their process. We then share a quick overview, short overview of the UK BIM framework, which again you will hear from uh, Sarah later on, plus a couple of quotes from uh, Dan Rossiter and David Churcher as well as part of that. And then the final page is our final thoughts. Uh, and again, it lists some of the projects that are ongoing and where we want to go ahead with the report, with the survey. This is the link. Like I said, I literally pushed it live five, 10 minutes ago, and you can now access this and download it. What I want to touch on is the positioning statements as well. So we've got, we've published one. Uh, and we've got a few more coming out. The first one we published was around, sorry, I didn't realize it built like this, is the BIM and Digital Twins one, um, where we talked about what BIM is, what Digital Twin is, where one starts and the other begins. It was a statement on behalf of the Alliance, sorry, and that, again, you can download that particular positioning statement and the link is there. As I mentioned, we're looking at some future positioning statements and they currently are looking at the golden thread, product data and net zero. If you think there are other statements that we should put out there, then please do get in touch and we will do that as well. I want to welcome some new patrons to the Alliance. Um, here we have our 
platinum patrons, as you can see, as they currently stand. And I'd like to welcome Tilbury Douglas as the latest platinum patron. They have literally just joined on and we're about to have our onboarding call in the next week. Following that, we've also had a couple of other patrons join. Here you can see our gold, silver, bronze, um, and then our latest one is GeoSlam. Again, we're about to have, or we'll have an onboarding call next week, but they have also joined the Alliance as a patron, and in their case, they've also joined the technology group as well. So welcome to both of those organisations. I want to touch on some events that are upcoming. Um, Let's focus on some of the community events. Anne's already talked to you about the communities and we have two coming up in July, one by the Beam for Housing Associations on the 12th of July and then the Kent region are putting on event towards the end of July. The communities team are also responsible for delivering the Back to Beam Basics campaign. You can see the number of questions that are part of that campaign and what we in the process of doing is going through the videos that have been recorded and these videos have been recorded by a number of people across a range of disciplines, mainly around and focused on the SME side. So these videos will play a part in the events and we're looking at starting the events in September. If you want to still get involved in this Back to Beam Basics campaign and would like to share your thoughts on those questions, let us know. We could still get you involved. We would just need to get your video recorded ASAP. Again, just get in touch with us. The next event upcoming in September is the CETA Beam Gathering, where the Alliance are involved as a partner. It's a virtual event over three days, and we'll be delivering, Anne and Casey will be delivering a keynote. Uh, as part of the agenda and then there's a seminar slot that is all around and based around the UK BIM framework and the UK BIM framework guidance which will be delivered by Sarah Davidson and David Churcher. One of the biggest events coming up or one of the yeah one of the bigger events coming up is UK Construction Week. The Alliance are the content, content partners for the Digital Construction Hub um, the event runs for three days, uh, which you can see here, and it is an in-person event. It's probably, good. well, I think it is the first in-person event that the Alliance will be involved in. We currently have a call for papers out and would love to hear from more of you who have a story to tell. Um, and it's your story to tell. Um, and we would like to hear case studies, challenges, whatever your opinions are around information management using BIM. What I will say is on the middle day of the conference, so the 6th of October, we are focused around manufacturing. We have almost got the agenda confirmed. We have a couple of extra slots available uh, where we have case studies being shared, we have panel discussions, and we have a keynote presenter. Again, if you have a case study you would like to share and you're sat within the manufacturing space, please get in touch with us. The other big event that we're also involved in again this year is Digital Construction Week, which is an in-person event at the end of November. So the Alliance is partnering with Digital Construction Week as content partner for both the BIM Village Theatre and the BIM Workshops Theatre. Another way the Alliance is involved is through the UK BIM Framework, where alongside CDBB and BSI, we are BIM sponsors for the whole conference. So there'll be a heck of a lot of activity taking place and it's just to make you aware of that. You will have seen a call for papers come out from uh, Digital Construction Week already, but we are targeting a specific one around BIM in the next few days. So please do watch out for that one. Just to make a note, Digital Construction is co-located with Geo Business this year. Uh, same date, same venue, just the hall next door. So it will be a fairly big event alongside DCW as well. Technology group. Um, so we have, since the last forum, we've had a couple of new members, uh, Dalux and Alecosoft. Apologies, I do struggle with that name. Um, and at the last meeting, we had a number of different presentations, an update from 
I'm going to bazooki building smart UK in Ireland. We had a conversation around modular uh, and offsite technologies. We talked about the 19650 standards and then the guidance. We had an update from a BIM interoperability expert group and then the BIM Cube, which you may or may not remember, has now become an implementation project and the technology group will be work working with the implementation team to update that as well. Looking ahead slightly, uh, the technology group were involved in reviewing 10 years of UK BIM and you will see and hear that from Paul a little later on. The agenda for our next meeting is around digital twins. So there'll be more of a discussion and we're just working through who will be invited to speak around that. And then towards the end of the year, we're focused around COP26. And there's a number of activities being talked about. Again, a positioning statement, a white paper, or we're also looking at Vox Pop videos as well. So, um, sorry, and just to go back on the digital twins, we are we have invited Hannah Vickers to to present, and we've potentially got Costain's head of innovation to present their perspectives on digital twins as well. So that's an update from the technology group. From an implementation point of view, there's a lot going on. Um, current projects. So we have the BIM for Housing Association's team are, wor are, are working on a project and the Alliance is helping them with aligning the, the toolkit they're issuing with the UK BIM framework. There's a link there to where you could go get more information. There is a host of new guidance coming out, including level of information need and mobilization amongst the fact that we're going to digitalize the uh, guidance as well. Um, the, the aim of the level of information need guidance is to create a set of basic principle guidance for level of information need for clients and the, the delivery team. The guidance will discuss how clients and the delivery team use level of information need at a project level and how it ties in with ISO 19650. The mobilization project includes the dig digitalization of the BEP and the EIR and the first draft of these documents is expected back on the 5th of July. So that's a, a big project also ongoing. We then have a BIM roles and responsibilities project. This is being uh, led by Women in BIM uh, and we're creating a user guide of BIM roles and responsibilities within organizations intended to help employees have a consistent understanding of the scope of a specific job role in the BIM job family. Again, this is currently being worked on and will go live in the next few months. Another project, ongoing project, is the 4D modeling planning and guidance project, which is looking at how to specify and deliver a 4D enabled project. And again, there's guidance around this as well. Infra Air is the other project that is going, uh, is taking place um, and they're developing a common approach to the specification of asset information requirements for infrastructure. This project is being included as part of the BAIG work, so the BIM Interoperability Expert Group's work, as well as the GIG work, which is Government Industry Interoperability Group. Sorry, I just had to remember what the acronym is. Um, so that they are working on that as well. And then the other project ongoing currently is the Golden Thread Initiative, which is a MHCLG and LNQ collaboration with the industry to develop requirements and processes for building safety information and a prototype, uh, a standardized digital golden thread, which will be aligned to the UK BIM framework. What I have been asked to share from the implementation team is the core for projects. Our project themes uh, that we're focusing on for this forum is information management in costing and how the information management can create effectiveness with cost management principles. And we're also looking at how information management and the core principles of the UK BIM framework can be utilised in academia, such as students, via students, such as universities, via students, PhDs and lecturers. 
if there's a specific project you feel that you think would benefit the industry, then please do fill out that uh, fill out the form on the link on the the slide there. And again, these slides will be shared afterwards with you. A quick update from Casey from the Building Smart UK Island or Bazooki as we call it. Um, Committee members have been voted into the International Infrastructure Steering Committee, and that's Phil Jackson and Marek. All of the committee members are involved in judging the international awards alongside 160 other judges around the world. Um, feedback's open for the IFC 4.3 infrastructure extension, and that can be found on the Building Smart International website. The professional certification scheme is almost ready to go. Um, we are actually in the process of updating the website. We've submitted mo um, modules to be approved and we're aiming to go live or in September for this. And just the final point on there is the point around the infra air project. Again, if, if you can help with that particular project, please do get in touch. So that's it from me, but I'm going to do a quick swap. There's next up will be Alison and bear with me, Alison, while I just sh stop sharing one screen and share another one um, to get your presentation on. Um, so there we go. Present, show screen, excellent. So Alison, I'm gonna hand over to you um, to talk about the government construction strategy from a people point of view. Alison, if you're not aware of Alison, you should be. Um, she's founder <laughs> and chief exec of Class of Your Own and is instrumental in the DEC program as well. So with that, Alison, I'm handing over to you. Thanks, Pam. I'll just check the all here before I stop off my usual Just repeat what you've just said, Alison, because I didn't catch any of that. We did have technical issues earlier with Alison as well. Alison, can I suggest you stop sharing your video and see if that helps? Hear it, yeah. Now, if you start Certainly again. Will. Okay. Is, that, is that any better? It is much better. Brilliant. Well, there you go. You don't have to look at my ugly face to know what I'm talking about. Um, Afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much, Pam and the team and Anne at uh, uh, BIM Alliance. Um, we've had a long uh, relationship and it's been a lovely relationship and uh, and you've helped me enormously over the years with support. I'm, I'm going to go into some of that. Um, but um, if you want to, uh, well, this, this Construction 2025, we are actually in it. And I just want to say for the record, the young lady on the front of this slide is not me. This is Shania Morris, who's currently a trainee construction manager with Renica Build in Manchester one of our fantastic DEC students who came through from 12 years old and she's now in her early 20s and building a successful career for herself. Um, and that's where I hope we're all going to be, um, you know, generating these wonderful kids coming through. It was certainly the imperative of the strategy um, to, uh, you know, achieve a really, really diverse, rich, uh, you know, um, gender uh, equal, uh, ethnicity equal um, uh, industry. And Anne mentioned the teenage years. I mean, they are indeed the most challenging years to introduce the construction industry. Uh, and after, you know, after years of trying, um, when I left school in 1989, I didn't know about the industry. Kids today don't know about the industry. It's worrying how many teachers, when we talk to them about construction industry and indeed delivering the design engineer construct program in their schools, they still say, oh, we've got a great, great group of boys. You know, they're not very bright. So we could we could put this with them. This this issue, this issue, this image, this perception is still there. I don't know if you want to just scroll uh, key to the next slide for me, Pam. 
So here it is, uh, our vision for construction. It's an industry that attracts and retains a diverse group of multi-talented people operating under considerably safer and healthier conditions. That has become a sector of choice for young people, inspiring them into rewarding professional and vocational careers. So I suppose the question is, has the Construction 2025 strategy had the impact that we hoped it would? Certainly as an organisation, uh, we created the Design Engineer Construct programme to do all this uh, in, in 2008 into 2009. Uh, and we do sincerely believe that education in this sort of way empowers and educates our children so they can literally jump into this extraordinary inter, uh, industry and into extraordinary careers. Um, next slide, please, Pam. So let's just put ourselves just for one moment into the shoes of ordinary everyday people, because after all said and done, the construction strategy wasn't about people in the construction industry. It was just simply about people. And one of the main drivers was to change the image, um, you know, and, and, and well, there we go, changes required in the construction industry itself and in how the construction industry is perceived by the public. So. This is Googling that I did this morning. I thought, well, let's do it on the day. Um, I Googled construction, I Googled UK construction, and we don't fare much better. I mean, in terms of diversity, you have to go down quite a few slides. If you click on images, go get down quite a few images before you actually find somebody who probably is a female or certainly into heavy rock with long hair. And certainly in terms of our um, ethnic minorities, you know, this is a guy, I guess possibly, well, I've seen a lot of guys like this in the uh, UAE when I was over uh, before lockdown, you know, a couple of hard hats on, not particularly dressed well, um, and, and indeed, you know, depicting the trades, essentially. And I believe that half the problem is the media, and I'm going to put it out there. Um, there are still articles where the text of the article reflects a modern industry, even a digital modern industry, but the photograph that's put into that news article portrays the same old male drilling a hole, boy building a wall. I mean, I've challenged a, a number of major construction publications over the years to ensure that their graphic teams actually talk to the reporters before they go to print. Because after all, this is mom and dad who are reading this, or the 14 year olds who are exploring the industry after a great STEM day with any of you guys who are on the uh, uh, meeting today. Um, so has it improved? Well. These are more rhetorical questions from me. I want to know what your thoughts are. And obviously at the Q&A in the end, you'll tell me what you think. But certainly when you have your own press releases from your own organizations, does the photo, you know, give, give justice to the text? Next slide, please, Pam. And according to the 2011 census, so that would have been the census around uh, the, the launch of the new strategy, women and girls make up 51% of the population of England and Wales and men and boys make up 49%. Eight to 6% of the population back in 2011 was white. So the workforce needs to be more diverse if it's to meet the challenges of the future. And our goal is to create an industry with a diverse workforce representative of society as a whole. Well. In 2009, we had 13.5% uh, uh, of the women uh, in industry and only 2% from ethnic minorities. Uh, only in 2019, it was 13% of women and 5.4% of BAME. So we're not doing so well. And it's hard to believe that seeing these headlines that you see today, after all this time, and despite some excellent efforts by our sector, and I could a whole spend a whole day reeling off the you know the different um, things and activities that are going on in different silos, we're still no better off. Uh, and the thing is, I'm a big believer in normalisation. If children grow up with construction, then they'll surely view it differently. So one of the uh, you know mandates of the of the strategy was that we would start earlier. So imagine if children studied our industry when they don't have a choice. Next slide, please, Pam. So the beauty of introducing a curriculum before GCSEs is that all children study a range of different subjects before they narrow down their own choices at 14 years old. And Design Engineer Construct is the only through school programme that's a curriculum subject in its own right, with its own qualifications that spans primary into 11 to 14, into 14 to 16, into 16 to 19, and even beyond. Some of our programmes now are being um, delivered in the first year of, of university. Um, 
And at the end of the day, these are specialist projects for young people in buildings and infrastructure. They're all STEM based, um, but they all, you know, really, really give children that breadth of softer skills, fusion skills, meta skills, whatever skills you want to call them, the stuff that they don't do through knowledge. And, you know, in 2013, when the strategy was launched, that was equivalent to GCSEs and A-levels. And we were very proud of that. You know, the Department for Education, I can remember when I took down my evidence of why this needed to happen for young people at a younger age group. The guy who was sat at the DfE just said, well, what child doesn't need to know about BIM? And I actually asked him to spell BIM because I thought, what well, somebody in the DfE who I've never spoken to before is saying BIM. Do you say B-I-M for mother? And he goes, yeah, 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 I'm working on the digital strategy. I'm working on the construction. I'm working in, in biz as it was then on DfE. And I could have across the table and kissed him because he actually said something that I profoundly believed to be true. And the, the fact that DEX is hugely respected by industry and academia to this day, it's cited in so many reports, including the construction strategy and indeed the Pharma Review. We indeed suffered at the hands of the politicians uh, back in 2018, because despite all this massive support that we still have now, uh, and indeed support from the UK BIM Alliance and its members, we lost performance measures, uh, that equivalency to GCSE A-levels, um, as the curriculum was narrowed to promote English bac baccalaureate traditional core subjects. And I remember even then, Langer Rock issued their 10 point plan to campaign for DEC to become a GCSE and A-level so the DfE couldn't touch it. But even now, we read the headlines, children are still falling behind. And I really do believe that, you know, this is due to kids not having a real sense of purpose for their learning. It's a one size fits all approach. Still, it's existed since Victorian times. And the new T-levels, however you feel about them, they can't be accessed until young people are 16. And there's nothing to stimulate or excite them in the curriculum before they get to that age. Next slide, please, Pam. So on to this month's headlines. The Education Select Committee, um, headed up by Robert Halfen, who's himself a major advocate of a knowledge and skills based curriculum, has just reviewed the levelling up agenda, which oh, let's not go into that. We haven't got time. But at the end of the day, the bottom line, poor white boys are still falling behind more than any dem demographic in, in, in UK education. And so when the tweet was out there from Robert Halfman about his mission to level up and blah, 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 and, and this BBC poorer white pupils let down and neglected headline came out just, just a, a couple of weeks ago, my tweet to Robert Halfman was this, is level up, leveling up possible when the current system puts all 11 year olds on an academic pathway with little or no access to work related education, for example, to show how STEM is used in work, and that enables more informed choices post 16. Next slide, please, Pam. Well, I'm not gonna have one minute to think you're gonna have time to read all this, but at the end of the day, the Education Select Committee report has just been issued, 21st of June, the forgotten, how white working class pupils have been let down and how to change it. And one of the, re one of the ways to change it is this, that, um, uh, recommendations are made to incorporate technical subjects pre-16. Again, just as they used to be. And you're just saying, oh, here's the political merry-go-round that is education starting all over again. Next slide, please, Pam. So I'm going to put this out to you. Design Engineer Construct, as included in Construction 2025, and indeed when I sat down with Paul Morrell, when the BIM uh, mandate was launched in 2011, I said, please, 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 Paul, as you're launching this for industry, please make sure there's an education strategy to make sure that schools and colleges keep up with the 21st um, uh, century industry. It's not quite happened. Um, I've been doing this for 12 years and I've ridden the roller coaster that is education. It's been hard and there's been some times where I've just thought, Oh, this needs to stop. I can't do this anymore. Let me just go back to being a land surveyor when life was easy. Because if we're going to hit the people focused objectives of the construction strategy by 2025, we really do need to see a more strategic joined up approach to educating young people for a modern industry. And I'd welcome a little more support. I'm trying really hard. And given we've just launched our first school in Australia, please, please, please don't let the UK be the last to win hearts of mind of ordinary everyday people. 
So the last slide, and it's a quick two minute film. Uh, Class of Your Own's just made this extraordinary film with the Construction Innovation Hub. Um, I'm gonna leave you to imagine this is your own child and all the children in your local school, and hopefully spark some of your own imagination to see change. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to play the video, Pam, that's me. Thank you, Alison. Fantastic presentation and a really good video. Um, I will share the link of the video, which is on YouTube um, as part of the questions with you shortly. Um, Thanks. So with, with that, let me take you to the next slides. Um, so we've now got three people talking process. Paul Shilcock, David Churcher and Sarah. Paul is going to talk about 1192 and what was BIM Level 2 hand over to David, who was recently awarded an MBE. So please join me in congratulating David uh, on his MBE. And David will be talking about 19650 development, who then hands over to Sarah to talk about the UK BIM framework and construction playbook. With that in mind, let me make Paul presenter and he will share his slides. There you go, Paul, over to you. Okay, thanks, Pam. Are my slides coming through? In fact, no, I've got All looking screen. good. Right, so screen. Still not the right screen? No, it's all looking good. Seems to be. Yeah. It's the same image as I saw earlier when you were doing it. Okay. Yeah, so. Cool. Right. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Pam. Um, yeah, as Pam said, this session really is about reflecting on the past decade from a process perspective. Uh, I'm going to kick off the session uh, by looking back at the first third, so from 2011 uh, to 2014. Uh, although it's probably not um, too fair to reflect too much on the progress that we made during this time, 
Okay, it was very much a, a mobilization period. Um, there was plenty of excitement, there was plenty of enthusiasm, uh, there's plenty of BIM conferences um, and plenty of presenta presentations on what BIM is, um, but also a lot of uh, misinformation and misunderstanding. And that other the hundreds of definitions of BIM, the, the one thing that remained uh, consistent throughout was that BIM is a process. Um, let's jump on to that. Okay, however, for me, one of the best things to emerge during this period was, was this community uh, of like-minded people that come together and start to pull in the, in the same direction. You know? Thankfully, as uh, Anne pointed out in her presentation, there's now a much broader church, you know, but it was a lot of fun uh, at the time. You know, and keeping the teenage theme, reflecting back at that time, it did feel like we were all back at school again, you know, learning about sex. You know, we all thought we knew what it was. We all thought that everybody else was doing it. Um, and we were all scared that we were the only ones not doing it. You know, when, when in reality, no one was really doing it. Well, not properly. I mean, not with someone else. You know, in fact, most people were doing it on their own. And yes, I'm still talking about BIM. Uh, and so we call this lonely BIM. Uh, but to look how far we've progressed from a protest perspective, you know, we've got to go back probably a little bit further than the last decade. You know, back to the time when we started to shine a light really on the failings of the industry and to produce lots of reports uh, on what we needed to do to improve, such as the Latham and Egan reports. And one of the failings that stood out from an information perspective <clears throat> was that the information that we were using was invariably inaccurate, incomplete, and ambiguous. You know, and therefore the decisions that we were making using this information was uh, often not the right ones. <clears throat> so to take on this particular challenge, uh, so John Egan put a team together to develop a process for the collaborative production of information that could ensure that information uh, would be accurate, complete, and unambiguous. And cutting the long story short, the process was developed and implemented on the Heathrow Terminal 5 project, and then independently tested on the Avanti Research project. The research indicated that the projects of any size that adopted this process could reduce wasteful activities by up to 20%. Um, and in 2007, the process was then uh, published as the British Standard BS 1192, developed by Mervyn Richards. So not only could we now produce information that was accurate, complete, and unambiguous, there was also the added bonus that by reducing these wasteful activities, we could do more work with the same resources or the same work with fewer resources. And at the time, this all sounded perfect, you know, and everybody got excited. But then I think people started to realize that for these outcomes to be achieved, everybody had to adopt the same approach, you know, and work together as a team. So undeterred, everybody came up with their, their own version of BS 1192, you know, which in reality meant that everybody was still doing it their own way and we were back to where we started. You know, and it became clear that we needed a catalyst for change. You know, we needed a strategy that everybody could get behind. So what, if, what would happen if the biggest construction client in the UK made this process a requirement on every project? You know, would this get everybody working collaboratively? You know, and this is the question uh, asked by Paul Morell, the inaugural chief government construction advisor back in 2010. And the answer that came back was a tentative yes. You know, there were still some commercial and technological uh, challenges to overcome. However, the team believed that you know, we could get most of the way there before the end of the current parliament, which is a, a few years later. And to explain exactly how far was, was realistic, uh, this napkin sketch done by Mark View and Mervyn Richards a few years earlier was used, you know, with the, with the red line indicating just how far uh, the team felt we could get as an industry. And don't get me wrong, you know, whether you love it or hate it, the wedge, as it became known, served its purpose at that time. You know, and the problem was, I think in my experience, that everybody focused too much on the output of the process at the top rather than the process itself at the bottom you know for me the process had to take priority over the data you know but everyone kept getting distracted by these bin models whatever they were you know and forgot that we had to work together as a team in order to produce them you know and this is the purpose of bs 1192 and those other standards in the diagram and as you can see even back then the plan was for these to become internationally agreed and integrated with the assets lifecycle management Nonetheless, BIM Level 2 entered our vocabulary forever, you know, and I guess sent a shockwave uh, around the world. You know, so at this point, 
we knew how the information needed to be produced. Um, but as a client, you know, the government was still a little bit foggy when it came to, you know, who needed this information, what information did they need, and when did they need it. So the next challenge really was to work out how could we ensure that the people producing the information knew exactly what information they had to produce, uh, why they needed to produce it, and when they needed to produce it. And so the plan then was to develop a new process for the management of information when adopting a collaborative approach to the production of information, which at this stage we started calling BIM for some reason. Um, and in doing so, ensure that the process you know, reflected industry best practice, uh, incorporated all the recommendations and from all the reports, including you know, putting the, the client at the center of the process uh, and to ensure uh, that it was applicable to the entire life cycle of the asset. And so myself and uh, Mervyn Richards were asked to produce PAS 1192 part two, which defined the information management process for the delivery phase, followed shortly after by PAS 1192 part three, written by David Churcher, covering the information management process for the operational phase. Uh, and for those of you who aren't aware, uh, part three is actually the prequel to part two. You know, it's just, I think at that time, we knew a bit more about managing information during the delivery phase than we did during the operational phase. So going back or reflecting in 2014, you know, we had um, you know, all the information management processes defined throughout the, the full asset life cycle. And now all everybody had to do was to spend the next couple of years aligning their existing processes before the 2016 mandate came into force. Uh, but again, you know, looking back, um, I think the way in which we probably communicated the process you know, probably could have been better. Um, Instead of using the standard process modeling notation, we opted to cram all three processes into one diagram, which uh, lovingly became known as the racetrack diagram. Uh, and personally, I think we were just trying to be a little bit too clever. Uh, and as a result, I think we may have lost people uh, along the way. You know, and I think for me, this became obvious when I, when I listened to a lot of people uh, discussing this diagram. Um, I think one of the biggest mistakes they often make was to present it as a linear process, you know, and aligning it with the project gateways, which meant that a lot of people thought the process was a one-time pass per project, you know, which is not the case. Um, but I think thankfully, you know, we've learned that lesson now, and I think the latest standards and guidance, you know, are much better at describing the information management process as a process. Okay, and then after that, um, uh, parts one, two, and three, the UK 1192 series continued with part four, five and six, you know, but really it's, it was part one, two and three that contained uh, the primary information management processes. Uh, and as we saw from the wedge, the, the idea was that all of these publicly available specifications within the UK 1192 series would eventually become uh, British standards. Um, in fact, we're in the process of updating PAS 1192 part two when the international supply chain started to get a little bit upset with so many asset owners and construction clients around the world specifying British standards within their contracts. You know, and clearly this gave the UK construction industry an advantage, you know, which of course was part of the master plan, uh, but I don't think anybody sort of expected it to happen so quickly. So rather than uh, the UK trying to impose standards on the rest of the world, you know, it was actually the rest of the world demanding that the UK 1102 series was elevated to international level you know and in doing so there would be a play, uh, level playing field uh, for everyone and that multinational delivery teams could adopt a unified approach you know, regardless of where in the world they or the asset were located so yeah and on that note uh, to tell you what happened next i'll hand you over to the one and only uh, mr david churcher mbe thanks paul um yes Handing over to David. So, David, you should be able to, and you have shared your screen. Hand over to you now. Thank you, Pam, and thank you, Paul. Uh, let me just put my camera on so you can see me as well. And uh, yes, so to pick up from where Paul has just left off, um, the development of the 19650 series uh, could be subtitled um, Seven Years in Seven Minutes. Uh, we started this journey in 2014 um, and it seems to have been quite a long time coming to where we are now and of course we're not really finished. 
if uh, let me just get to my next slide. Standards development um, is one of the key phrases to make people switch off when they're listening to any presentation. Um, and I certainly haven't got as snazzy slides as we've had so far this afternoon. Um, but it did strike me while Paul was talking that there's quite a lot in parallel between the process of developing international standards, which is, after all, a collaborative exercise based around uh, finding a common purpose, and the processes that we're describing for managing information on projects and in the asset lifecycle. That's quite maybe a tenuous link. Um, and maybe the, the development process of standards is perhaps even more tortuous than some of the projects that we are engaged in. Um, it's taken seven years to get this far. Um, and it took four and a half years, as you can see, for the first two parts of 19650 to emerge from this consensus based process. Um, Paul and I both, I think, gained a lot of grey hair and seemed to uh, sail serenely through the whole process for most of the time. Um, uh, but there was a lot of uphill battle, um, even if the international community said they wanted um, BS 1192 in an international framework. Um, that wasn't really how they reacted when they saw it. But anyway, uh, what we have now is uh, parts one, uh, two, three and four, three and five rather, um, already published. Parts one and two, of course, were published in December 2018, and those are uh, BSEN ISO standards. So not just ISO, but also European standards. That's actually quite an important uh, distinction because it really switches on the minds of all of our European colleagues and partners because they know they're going to have to implement these standards when they are released through their agreements with the European Standardization Committee. But actually quite a lot has happened in the last uh, couple of years and indeed just in uh, the last 12 months um, we've had two new parts published and completed so parts three and five uh, we've had part four continuing its development i'll say a little bit more about these uh, in a moment and as, as Anne mentioned uh, earlier on we've got the new newest part six um, starting its journey towards uh, ISO publication. And what we learned during the development of the certainly uh, parts one and two, which, which took a long time, but for a reason, is that there's, there's nothing quite like trying to teach uh, a room full of um, willing and unwilling uh, participants uh, about a topic to really make you understand it yourself. Uh, so I think Paul and I actually learned huge amounts ourselves about the way that the original UK documents, the, the original BS and that the PAS part two had been written and had been structured, which we could then build on and improve on when developing the, the international equivalents. So that was that was a big challenge. Uh, and when we did take the opportunity to correct two of the big impressions, the mis misimpressions, I think, that, that came through from the, the earlier uh, PAS document was that on the first hand that clients didn't have a great deal to do which of course we all know is wrong uh, they have a huge amount to do and, and in fact the whole the whole process to be successful hangs off of of their intentions and their ambitions but also that that point Paul made about this being a once through process uh, we tried as best we could to uh, to correct that impression in the way that the ISO was written um, I dare say we're not perfect in that yet, uh, but certainly we're a lot better uh, at explaining that than we were. But we did have some big successes as well. And I think for me, it's the fact that to all intents and purposes, the CDE process, that, that sort of classic diagram, pretty much um, got through unscathed into, the, into ISO 19650. And so that is now accepted internationally as uh, a process to deliver correct, unambiguous and complete information. Let me just say a few words about the most recent two parts of the, the ISO family. So part three um, and part five, these were both published in the summer of last year, as I'm sure many of you will be aware. Um, but 
the outcomes that we've achieved on both of these documents are subtly different to where they started from. So um, part three, of course, uh, is the ISO implementation of PAS 1192 part three, but its scope is much broader. Um, we took the opportunity to mirror the, the structure and, and the, the, the information management process steps that had already been developed and, if you like, hammered out uh, through the part two development. And we took advantage of all of that good work and, in effect, just rewrote it for the, the broader framework of asset lifecycle rather than project delivery. So that meant some fairly fundamental changes in the way that people who approached PAS 1192 Part 3 will need to maybe rethink their, uh, their, their, um, their perspectives when looking at implementing the ISO. There are now requirements on the asset owner as well as the asset contractors, whereas in the PAS it was just on the asset owner primarily. Um, and the process itself, the, the steps that you go through to manage information um, in relation to an asset or a facility, now has the same uh, reflection of, of sort of asset-wide or facility-wide um, steps, but also appointment-specific steps, which are really getting down to the very nitty-gritty of the, the appointments of individual providers of information. And I think we've also been a little bit smarter about how the process responds to different kinds of event that give rise to the need for information, the trigger events in our, in our, in our language. Um, so that, that has actually led to a very complicated diagram of, of laying out how the steps fit together, um, much more complicated than the, than the, than the diagram that, that exists in 19650 part two, but it still has all of the same intentions and the same key elements in it. In contrast, uh, part five, um, the security minded uh, standard, that is a much closer um, representation of the original PAS. Uh, yes, it did lose all of the BAS acronyms, which probably I hope nobody's too fussed about, uh, but it did really retain that, that same core structure of, of steps. We go through assessment and triage to work out how much security mindedness we want or we need. And if so, then we go through the steps of developing a security strategy and then a management plan, and then finally making sure that all of the, that good work is brought to bear in other parts of the, the information management process. So, so those, those two um, are the newest parts of the uh, 19650 suite. And finally, just to finish, uh, looking forward to the, uh, the two um, parts that we have coming, part four, which is about information exchange, and part six, which has just started its journey and covers the health and safety information process. So um, again, uh, part four is a bit of a diversion from what we currently have as BS 1192 part four, which is effectively COBE. Um, actually, COBE isn't anywhere in the current draft of 19650 part four, and it's not going to be either, because that is not an internationally agreed framework that the working group was able to um, accept. So what we have are some broader criteria for uh, reviewing the information containers that are submitted or received at information exchange. So not just about structured data, but actually any information container, uh, documentation or geometrical uh, information. And there are a set of criteria that have been specified in this draft standard. And it, I believe, is or has just been circulated for public consultation. So there will be a chance for uh, the world at large to, to have a read and to give their feedback to be taken forward into the final edition. So hopefully 19650 part four will emerge in uh, uh, 2022. Um, and when it does, uh, then the UK will need to work out how it's going to retain its COBE specification, um, either as a national annex, um, or, or possibly uh, some other way. Um, so, you know, to make sure that we still have the ability to specify and understand COBE in the way that we have through the, the BS uh, for the last four or five years. And finally, uh, part six, this is really just starting, so not a great deal I, I can say on this um, particular uh, part of, of, of the ISO, 
Um, Zane Allhack is going to be the technical author for it. It's really just started, uh, and that really means we are looking at public consultation sort of towards the end of next year or early 2023, and hopefully publication late 2023 or early 2024. Uh, doesn't take uh, a genius for you to work out that that will give us, bring us almost exactly to uh, 10 years from the beginning of the 19650 journey. So um, this is, this is a, a task that is not to be undertaken lightly of developing international standards. It's incredibly satisfying, and, and I think we've all got a lot out of it, uh, but it's certainly not for the faint-hearted. And maybe if I can leave you with a question for you to, to mull over, and if you've got any observations on this in the Q&A session, that would be great. But uh, I'd be interested to know whether anyone uh, thinks that the change to ISO over the last three or four years has helped UK implementation of information management using BIM, or has it actually thrown up new barriers? Um, I dare say there's a bit of both, but hopefully uh, more help uh, than hindrance. So let me move uh, on to the uh, to introduce our final speaker uh, in this little session, Sarah Davidson, who's going to be taking you back to the bigger picture and uh, explaining and reflecting on the UK BIM framework. But thank you uh, from, from me. Thank you, uh, David. Uh, Pam, can I just check that you can see my screen? I can, yes, thank you. Brilliant. Okay. Uh, yes. So I'm going to just uh, give a brief uh, presentation about the UK BIM framework and the construction playbook. Uh, and we'll start off really with the road to the UK BIM framework. But you've heard a lot about this this afternoon. Um, both Paul and Anne talked about the journey going back or starting out around 2007. And here we are uh, some considerable time later. So we, we know that we've moved along from BIM level two now, that's history. And we've heard about the uh, ISO 19650 series of standards uh, part one and part two being released in 2018. And those standards form the basis of the UK BIM framework alongside uh, some remaining standards from 1192 and uh, 536 as well. And I'll just come on to those in a moment. Uh, so since 2018, we've been working on uh, developing guidance and resources to enable industry to adopt, to implement the recommendations and requirements in those standards. And then in last year, in December 2020, we had the launch of the construction playbook. And if you're familiar with the construction playbook, you'll you'll realize will have read that actually it refers to recommends the adoption of the UK BIM framework, which is a really strong message of support for what we're trying to achieve. So when we look at the standards, we've mentioned them already, and I, I'm really grateful because it means that I can I can maybe cut this presentation shorter slightly, and that you're probably pleased about that too. So we can see the ISO 19650 series of standards on the left, and we've got the uh, PAS 1192 uh, part six, and we've got the BS 8536 standards for top landings. And the most recent update uh, came in February this year, when um, the National Annex to uh, ISO 19650 Part 2 was updated, and um, that was following a quite a detailed consultation period. And um, you'll know if you're working on the correct or the, or the most recent version, because it will say uh, incorporating uh, Corrigendium 1, and, and we'll have the 2021 date after it. So the UK BIM framework comprises those standards um, but it also comprises, it's quite technical guidance, I guess, around how to implement those standards. And then we have resources supporting the implementation. And I'd really like to mention the um, UK BIM Framework Information Protocol, which was launched um, earlier in this year. And that's the currently uh, the protocol that is available for implementing ISO 19650 Part 2. So it supports the capital delivery phase. And it can be used with standard forms of contract and it can be used with non-standard um, forms, bespoke forms as well. And it's wholly collaborative. So I just wanted to 
If you weren't aware of the uh, protocol, I just wanted to alert you to that. In terms of the guidance, so the, the guidance group was established more or less, I think it was three years ago, Ju July 2018. And that was really when my involvement in uh, the standards work um, really got, got a lot more detailed. And so alongside David Churcher and Anne Kemp, I'm one of the editors uh, for the guidance and we all do do authoring as well. But the guidance group is, um, it's a real, Great, it's a great story about a collaborative endeavour of people coming together, um, people from across industry, from across the whole of the UK that have been coming together now for three years, um, giving their time and expertise to develop this guidance. And because it's such a large group, um, it means that we've been able to challenge each other uh, to make sure that what we're writing makes sense and can be digested. And hopefully we hit the mark, but we also have um, a significant feedback group feeding into us as well. And actually the guidance, and you've seen Anne put up this slide earlier with the structure on it, you'll see that it comprises um, quite a few parts to it now. All of the guidance is go undergoing a feedback activity at the moment, as well as new guidance being authored. So it's a busy time. And what I would say is that it's been a busy time since we started writing the guidance. Um, to enable the transition to ISO 19650 and then guidance part one. So the next update to the guidance, we're planning for release in September 2021. We're going to see some really helpful content there. So we're going to see, for example, um, uh, content in guidance E, uh, explaining about the information standard, we're going to see uh, more examples of information requirements focusing particularly on health and safety. We will see an update to part C or guidance C to accommodate the changes introduced through the 2021 National Annex. And we'll have an update as well to guidance part two to accommodate or to provide more insight into that National Annex. We're, under, we're reviewing the guidance generally to make sure that we've picked up on the uh, release of ISO 19650 Part 3 as well. And we're also doing work around um, developing a scope of appointment for information management function. But actually, there's an information management assignment matrix available on the UK BIM Framework website uh, that sort of is offers the real detail around that um, scope of appointment. As Anne mentioned earlier as well, we are going to look at release of guidance in uh, uh, an online format that will enable navigation or it'll improve navigation around the guidance. We've got, it's quite hefty now. And we're also looking, looking at layering the guidance. So when you read the guidance, some of it is quite technical. And we maybe need to look at how we develop more uh, persona-based guidance that uh, has basic principles and then that leads into the technical data, technical detail. So I think I just finished there by saying that the guidance is really informed by industry and we do welcome your feedback. And um, you can provide feedback in, in all parts of the guidance and on the UK BIM Framework website, there is a mechanism to provide e feedback via an email. So the construction playbook uh, was published in December 2020. And the forward, uh, I've just extracted some information from the forward there. So the construction playbook builds on the national infrastructure strategy and supports the government's ambition to transform our infrastructure network so that we can build back better, faster, and greener. And a central theme to the construction playbook is getting projects and programs right from the start. And of course, with when we were talking about um, BIM Level 2 way back in 2013, we always said that this was about um, starting with the end in mind. So making sure we knew what the outcomes that we wanted to achieve were, working back from them, from them and making sure that we'd got the processes, as Paul talked about, in place to enable those outcomes to be realized. So the UK BIM framework is absolutely fundamental to this theme of getting projects and programmes right from the very start. And, and, and that um, will also enable us to embed digital technologies um, with greater impact. And Paul uh, will be talking about those in just a moment. So how do they all come together? 
the way that I look at it is that information really sits at the heart, information management sits at the heart of everything. And it really requires process and it requires a collaborative effort. And as David said earlier, we, you know, we often or have historically maybe missed clients out of the jigsaw, but actually they, they're the starting point, they're fundamental to a successful information management process. If we've got a successful information management process in place, then we can deliver um, the uh, ambitions of a soft landings methodology. And that's what the UK BIM framework is all about, making sure that we've got those processes in place, making sure that um, pe people, what you, you understand where you are in the process, you understand what your obligations are and how they feed into other people's activities. And as both David and Paul alluded to, it's not being a linear process, but it actually, it actually um, being appointment-based process. So the activities will repeat uh, for, for different appointments, but also they can repeat within appointments. So for example, information delivery within an appointment can repeat lots of times. So just bringing it all together, I think our adoption of the UK BIM framework and whether that's because we want to, because we see that it's really going to help improve our business outcomes, or it's because we're required to, for example, if um, it's referenced in a, a bid documentation, then it's wholly reliant on teams, both asset teams and project teams working together. And that's to require the information, going back to the image and put up right at the very, very beginning, the very simple image around you require information, you plan it, you generate it, you authorise it, you accept it, you learn from it. So if you require information, if you produce it or you manage it, and I think that that will hit upon everybody that's listening in today, then the UK BIM framework will help you to do this really effectively. So I would just urge you to uh, go to the website, ukbimframework.org, to look at the um, guidance to look at the uh, resources that we've got to help you to implement the uh, standards whether you're in the project delivery space or the asset management space or actually you use uh, overlap cover both of those so thank you very much thank you sarah um, some fantastic presentations from the three of you um, i just wanted to add that for each of the speakers so far, and for Paul, uh, who's going to be next, um, we do have a bio slide, although I haven't shown it as part of the, the slides I've been sharing. Um, they will be included in the version that will be downloaded after, uh, yeah, after the event, but shared next week. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Paul, I think, if I can get it to work. Uh, and it's the wrong Paul. There we go. Paul, it is all yours. Who is going to be talking technology? Good morning, everybody. Uh, sorry, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Paul, the next... sorry. Just to interrupt, we're seeing the wrong slide. So we're seeing your actual presenter's view. This didn't work. This didn't... There we That's go. it. Perfect. It didn't happen when we tied it on test. No. Earlier. Anyway. <laughs> All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my themes for the next 10 minutes or so are going to be focusing on technologies, but not just the technologies on their own, the technology businesses behind them and how we find out about the technologies. Um, I'll be touching on some of the activity we've seen over the past 10 years, vendor merger and acquisition, investment in technology, the growth in use of mobile devices and mobile apps. Um, I'll touch on the BIM adoption um, uh, in that process as well, but also the emergence of, of new buzzwords, new buzz phrases, things like digital twins, and picking up on some of the themes from the um, uh, recent meetings of the uh, technology group. I'll also be touching on uh, interoperability, climate change, product data, some of the things that uh, you perhaps heard mention of already. Um, but top of my list really has been, um, you know, the complexity of the market. And, you know, and I think there was a lot of thinking that we really needed uh, a sector, uh, a <coughs> bit of rationalization 
of what was a very complex space. Um, we've seen over the past 10 years a considerable amount of uh, merger and acquisition activity. Um, this is a sample really of just many of the names that we have within the industry. As some of these names are no longer with us. A significant proportion are now part of larger groups. So I'd pick out of that, for example, BIW became Conject, which became Aconex, which is now part of Oracle's portfolio. Trimble is a member of the technology group, and it too has been acquisitive. It's acquired SketchUp for projects, which in itself acquired Priority One. Um, it acquired a US document collaboration specialist called eBuilder. And uh, ERP vendor viewpoint acquired four projects and it and itself was then acquired by Trimble. So you see uh, examples already of, of some rationalization in the space. We've seen the same with two other American companies, um, again, both members of the technology group in, in Bentley and Autodesk. Bentley's portfolio includes three um, UK based technology businesses, Synchro, Group BC, and PCSG. And Autodesk has expanded from its design roots to grow what it's called the Autodesk Construction Cloud, augmenting BIM 360 with Plan Grid and Building Connected, uh, amongst other tools. And it's not just US firms that have been active in mergers and acquisitions. Sweden's Hexagon acquired Brixis in 2018 to put alongside some other familiar names. And Germany's Nemechek um, has a number of members from the technology group, Vectorworks, Graphisoft, Bluebeam and Solibri um, among them. Uh, but there are also um, some smaller players engaged in merger and acquisition. Uh, acquisition activity. NBS and Glenigan are now part of the Big Factor Group. Think Project has acquired um, the UK-based CMAR and Formworks plus RAM, um, an asset management business from New Zealand. And Germany's RIB has been acquiring businesses around the world in India, China, South Africa and the US and has itself been acquired by Schneider Electric. This graph shows the market capitalization of those same six large groupings that I've just described. And alongside that um, uh, merger and acquisition activity, there's been considerable investor interest in Contech firms, three significant IPOs in the past decade, including just over a month ago, um, that of uh, technology group member Procore. However, none of these main technology groups are even a quarter of the way towards becoming uh, a Microsoft, a two trillion dollar company like, like uh, Microsoft and Apple. Oracle is the big beast in the AEC space, but its market capitalization, capitalization means it's roughly, uh, <clears throat> roughly equal to the other six businesses combined, but yet only perhaps uh, an eighth of the size of Microsoft. McKinsey Group has been invest, uh, monitoring investments in the constru construction technology space and venture capital investment has, has really outstripped investment in other sectors, particularly from about 2016 onwards. McKinsey logged around 25 billion dollars invested over 10 years and even just today we've we've heard news of yet another major investment this time in a UK based business 120 million being uh, invested in Causeway technology is probably one of the biggest investments that I can recall in a UK business and McKinsey is also talking about the rise of the platform era and I think that's evident from the merger and acquisition activity we've got a number of large firms building up um, a portfolio, a platform of, of um, applications that can be used to deliver construction projects. Two major trends um, in parallel with all of the investment activity include the continued uh, and accelerating shift towards cloud infrastructure services. We're also seeing uh, a major shift towards mobile devices. Uh, you know, it's 
little more than 13 years since iPhone and Android were launched in 2008 and people in developing country in developed countries increasingly likely to own a smartphone and the UK has the world's highest smartphone present uh, penetration with four out of five people now owning a smartphone. Um, <clears throat> when we look at smartphone use, um, American uh, surveys suggest around 92% of construction industry workers use smartphones uh, at their work. They're commonly using their devices for field data capture, for accessing customer or project documents, for viewing design information, whether that's in BIM or whether they're still working in 2D and using drawings and so on, and also for things like scheduling and time management. Talking about BIM, the U and Pam mentioned earlier the UK BIM Alliance's um, State of the Nation survey. This shows 65% of respondents aware of and using BIM. And this is broadly in line with similar data from NBS's 10 years of surveys, which have shown awareness, adoption and use growing since 2011, from 13% use in 2011 to 73% of the sample in 2020. Um, but some of you may have seen comparisons between the UK's adoption of BIM and that of other countries in Europe. Um, both Building and BIM Plus have reported on a survey by Plan Radar. It shows the error of focusing, I think, on pockets of data. Scandinavia is not covered in the Plan uh, Radar report, yet in Denmark, you know, you can see the numbers I've put on the screen. 50% of architects were using BIM in 2006. In 2007, 93% of Finland architectural firms, 60% of engineering firms were using BIM routinely. And Norway has been deploying IFC and BIM file formats since 2010. For this presentation, I decided to also have a quick look at how interest in BIM has grown. I'm looking at two sources of information not explicitly included in either the Alliance or the NBS surveys, though I think both tools may lead people to some of these uh, same other sources. So I, I firstly started off by looking worldwide at, at trends in people searching for information about building information modeling. And you can see the data suggests that the frequency of searches began to grow from about 2011, um, strangely enough. But if we could look worldwide and we look just at that last decade, 2011 to date, you can see a bit of difference. The worldwide upward trend is clear. The US trend is less clear and probably a bit more gradual. UK searches on BIM grew steadily through the first half of the decade and then plateaued. Um, that might not be quite clear, so I, I added a trend line to these graphs to try to make things a bit clearer. Worldwide interest in BIM has grown almost continually to a recent peak in 2021, for example. If we look at the United States, searches on BIM started to grow from about mid-2016. Was this a coincidence um, coinciding with the BIM mandate, or was it perhaps a reflection of the in increasing levels of investment that US firms and uh, US investors were making in BIM around about that time? And if we look at the UK, steady growth in BIM searches right up to the time of the BIM mandate. But perhaps then, because BIM was now familiar, searches plateaued and perhaps have even started to decline. Um, you know, in a rhetorical question, do we need to stimulate some new interest about BIM? Do we need to take uh, a, a, a clearer view of the business case for BIM? Um, and if it isn't familiarity with BIM that prompted that decline, what else might we uh, point a finger at? I've got one small suggestion. Data from the English-speaking version of Wikipedia um, has data from about 2016 onwards. The BIM article was started more than 10 years earlier and consistently was achieving around 30,000 page views a week. The Digital Twin article started 
2017. And the peaks and troughs in searching for BIM and Digital Twin appear to coincide, but Digital Twin is now outstripping BIM. Maybe we've, you know, we've, we've moved on in our buzzword allegiance. Certainly, Digital Twin worldwide has grown in searches uh, uh, by people interested in that topic since 2017 uh, onwards. We've also seen growth in uh, specific BIM specific terms like common data environment. Um, this is really only began to provoke interest from around about 2014 onwards. But if you drill into some of the information, the main places interested in common data environment were uh, have particularly been the UK and Germany, um, amongst others. Other buzzwords, laser scanning and photogrammetry, pretty much steady state over um, the past decade. But if we look at augmented reality and virtual reality, um, VR interest spiked again in 2016, though I think this was possibly due to the March 2016 launch of HoloLens, followed about a year later by the launch of Magic Leap. Um, HoloLens is something which um, is supported by both Bentley and Trimble. Trimble's uh, XR10 technology supporting HoloLens um, 2 was, support, was launched in 2019, for example. And you might recall the Daiquiri helmet, which was launched again in 2016, but that, that business folded in September 2019. Um, but there's continuing interest in the whole field of uh, AR. And I spoke, I saw recently that London-based XYZ recently raised £25 million in funding to fund its growth in, in, the, in the marketplace. Maybe we'll see them in the technology group in due course. So what else have, have we been focused on in the technology group? This is my really my last slide. <coughs> We've we've been fortunate, I think, to see the pandemic has uh, prompted a lot of people to expand their adoption and use of digital technologies, particularly those that enable online and remote working. Um, but around that and looking forward, um, as you've heard earlier, our uh, agenda increasingly is looking at digital twins. That's on our September meeting. We've got climate change for the uh, December meeting. A perennial item is now interoperability, and we've touched, we've had presentations from um, Alex Luck on security, and we'll be obviously focused a bit more on on areas like offsite, design for manufacture and assembly, and the whole area of product data remains live within the technology group going forward. Hopefully, that gives you a view of uh, what we've seen and where we're going in the technology group. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. That was very fascinating. Thanks a lot. Uh, we are very short on time, so we're going to have to defer Q&A. So we, anyone that's raised a question, we will respond offline. I've now got the task of very quickly trying to summarise what we've heard today. So I think just very quickly, I think it was a fascinating review of the last 10 years, uh, right at the beginning, lots of images bringing back all sorts of memories, uh, mainly good, I would suggest. Uh, one that really stood out to me was the sort of key decision points versus the data provided that sort of feels like a common issue that I still find today. Moving on to the people, I think, you know, the stats that Alison um, read out around diversity, I think it still really hits home how low that is. Uh, and the fact that the image of construction isn't going to change itself without the engagement of, you know, our, our younger members of society and getting, getting those people involved and educating them and, and providing that sort of level of service that we're perhaps not doing at the moment. So I think that's a really important message process again what Paul said about process being really important really rings true with rings true with me you know trying to get those right tasks done first uh, to get the outcomes you want later on too many people kind of worry about the end point before they get the right things in the right order so I think that's a really important message as well um, uh, David's request for feedback on the ISO nice and brave I thought there so yeah please give him that please please provide that feedback has it made a difference to you are, are you seeing improvement hopefully you are as, as he said uh, and then the playbook, I thought with the playbook, you know, we are seeing that that's 
being picked up by procurement teams at the moment. So people are asking about the playbook. So the fact that that includes the UK BIM framework, I think is only a good thing for those that have engaged with this so far. So if you haven't read the playbook, I suggest you do, because I think there's, there's a lot in there. And then finally, from a technology point of view, from just heard from Paul there, I mean, the volume of technology providers that you put on the screen and the acquisitions that have happened, you just realize how many different bits of technology you probably interact with on a daily or weekly basis, even if you're not a license holder or an owner of that software yourself. So that in itself was quite fascinating, I thought. Um, and then sort of I was just reflecting, could I do my job today without technology? And I think I know the answer to that. So a very whistle stop summary of what I heard today and what was important to me. Hopefully you got a lot out of it as well. Uh, just really um, leads me to thank all of the speakers today. Some excellent presentations, lots of these, so lots of reflecting back on what we've seen and a lot of food for thought, I think, in terms of where we're going. So really good presentations. Thank you. Thank you all. And hopefully you all enjoyed it and we'll, we'll see you again soon. So thank you very much.